Hello and welcome to Northminster. Today is the third of our Holy Week stories. As we've walked this Lenten road of exploring nonviolence, we have wondered together about what it looks like to communicate nonviolently, to allow our commitment to this nonviolent way of Jesus to affect not just how we interact with others on a physical level, but how we engage and relate in everyday conversations, and especially as we communicate with those who know us most intimately. If violence is our attempt to assert our will over that of another, there are very few of my own relationships that I can think of where I haven't been guilty of that at one time or another. Our third storyteller this week is Pat Hayes, sharing a story of the ending of her marriage and learning to let go of resentment. May these stories draw us deeper into the story of Holy Week, the truths of what it means to be human, and where God might be found in our endings and in our new beginnings. It was the third year of my Total Life reboot, and I was at work feeling angry and bitter and totally miserable. It was also Monday. When their father and I had switched out the kids last evening from their every other weekend with him, he told me that he wanted to have the children for the summer. I could have them every other weekend. He had remarried, and I knew he and his wife wanted more time with the children. What had stung was being told that this was what was going to happen, and further, that he would be cutting the child support in half for the summer. With the children in one car and the two of us in the other, We had one of the most heated arguments ever. Ugly things were said by each of us. We had rarely argued during our marriage, but this was the stored up anger of several years, spilled out like lava from an erupting volcano or two. I could see the worried faces of our children in the other car. They must have been frightened. I had a well-paying job as an RN, and we lived very modestly. There was, however, rent, utilities, a car note, insurance that were not affected by the absence of the children. These were a continuing expense. I didn't think I could afford to go to court to object to this change in our arrangements. At the time, my ex-husband's salary was about double mine. Did I mention that he was an attorney? Being a single working mother wasn't easy, but the children had always been with me. What if they decided that they preferred to live with their dad and their stepmom and their new stepbrother? I was emotionally devastated by my fears and hurt and angry about the things we'd both said the night before. On that Monday, I was very close to wishing harm to my ex-husband. I struggled with guilt, guilt that I bore the majority of the responsibility for our marriage failure by not being the wife he wanted. My self-confidence, at least regarding my personal life and self, was zilch. I had been mildly successful in my career in the three years since I'd gone back to work after our separation, so it was about the only thing in life that I could feel very positive about. I had left the Catholic Church after our marriage was annulled by the marriage tribunal. This was another blow. We had married with complete confidence and assurance 
that our union would be everything a marriage in Christ should be. I had believed very strongly that events had led me to the Catholic Church and to my husband. I said I was happy for the annulment because it would enable Joe to remarry and remain in communion with his church. I didn't actually feel that it applied to me anymore, but I wasn't sure that remarriage was an option. In reality, being a single working mother left very little time uh, to meet an eligible partner. My feelings about my abilities as a mother had dipped and dove with some occasional high points. At least half the time, I felt like a failure. I wasn't sure that even God could help fix me or my life. Having had one of the most heated arguments with my ex-husband in our lives, I didn't feel that I had any options. The children would be spending the summer with their dad and new family. I would be alone and find ways to make up for the missing income, and I hoped I wouldn't be displaced by a new stepmom. I happened to encounter my personal family doctor in the hospital hallway. We had known each other for a number of years. He was a charismatic Christian and had been known to lay hands on his patients and pray with them during their appointments. His office nurse was in my Sunday school class. He'd also been my parents' family doctor. He stopped and asked if something had happened. I must have looked very upset. Without planning to, I spilled everything. Words tumbling out, tears streaming. I told him of my anger and near hatred of my ex-husband, of my worries about money, about my concerns for the children, and of my fear that I would lose them. He prayed with me there in the hallway and told me to read Matthew 18, verses 34 and 35. And his master got angry and handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he could pay everything that was owed. So my heavenly father will also do to you if each of you does not forgive his brother from his heart. When we hold anger in our hearts, we actually turn ourselves over to be tortured. Bitterness, he told me, is anger and hatred that's kept suppressed. It is violence that is self-directed. I ended up reading all of the Gospel of Matthew, and it did comfort me. Over the years, I've gone back again to find guidance and comfort. But how much better might it have been if we were able to bypass the anger and resentment and bitterness? How might we avoid going to these dark places within ourselves? I'm not a violent person. I have struggled to manage anger through the years. But not being violent and being nonviolent are different things I have learned. Not violent is a negative particularly when we direct our anger inward so as not to express it outwardly. Over many years, like 40 plus, I'm learning that nonviolence is not passive, sheeply behavior, but positive acceptance and understanding of an alternate point of view or position. If I apply what I have learned to the situation I described in this story, I would examine why I was angry and understand all of the fears that fueled it. I would extend grace to myself for being afraid and needing comfort and reassurance. I would extend that grace to Joe and his wife and understand that they also had fears. It might have been possible for us to see the other's point of view. 
I'm happy that through the years and through some painful experiences, our family has been able to experience a degree of understanding and enjoy some times together. I can't say that I don't feel anger sometimes. I struggle to understand how two parents can feel so differently about their adult children and their grandchildren. I work at accepting that my point of view may not be the right one and that other ideas may have greater merit than my own. During this Holy Week, I pray for myself and any others who wrestle with finding their way to agreement or at least understanding when others seem to be enemies, clinging to positions that are objectionable, even abhorrent to us. May we remember that fear, distrust, and lack of understanding found its outlet in violence. The one who lived a life of love and compassion was brutally executed by those whom he came to save. May God grant us wisdom and compassion to deal with those situations or people who ignite our anger. Help us to understand. Grant us grace to love ourselves so that we can truly love others.